I've drawn here several examples of vector fields on different dimensional manifolds. For instance, here we have something that looks sort of like a circle. It's really a loop. And we have a vector field whose vectors are tangent to the loop at every single point. And it doesn't matter whether or not the vector field vanishes or that vector field vanishes. In both cases, in all of these cases, the vector field looks like it's smooth and it's always tangent to the surface or the line on which it's defined. Similarly, here we have a sphere with a vector field. You can see it's sort of like moving. If, if I looked at the integral curves, they would be circles around the sphere. And in this case, we have a torus. And these are sort of, you can think of these vectors as sort of moving along one direction, one of these circles. And all the integral curves are sort of going to make loops around this particular um, part of the donut. So we want to make the definition of a vector field on a manifold uh, more precise to distinguish it, for example, from, um, let me just illustrate a, sim a similar example. I can even draw this on here with this different color. If I drew a vector like this that sticks out of this, even though this vector might be varying smoothly with the points, um, I wouldn't call it uh, a tangent vector field. Um, and instead, I would just maybe call it a vector field. But most of the times when we say vector field, we'll mean tangent vector field. So let's say M is a smooth manifold, a tangent vector field, and let's even say a smooth tangent vector field on M is a function, is a smooth function, V that assigns to every point in M a vector. But where should that vector live? Well, since M is embedded in RK, let's use that fact. So we're going to get a vector at every point in M that's in RK, but not only is it in RK, and by the way, we write at any point x, we use a subscript um, because this reminds us of the tangent space such that V subscript x is in the tangent space of M at the point x for all x in M. So it says that for every point on the manifold that we have, the tangent vector, this vector, which is a vector in RK, is actually in the tangent space of the manifold at that point. So this is what we mean by a smooth tangent vector field. And I may often, though I shouldn't, omit the word tangent. And we made sense of what it means to define the index of a vector field at a critical point in Euclidean space. We can also try to make sense of what it means to calculate the index of a vector field on a manifold at a critical point. For instance, in this sphere example, or even in this circle example, both of these situations have two critical points. Here we have the north and the south pole. Those are critical points because that's where the vector field vanishes. And here we have a critical point at this point and another critical point somewhere here. And we can calculate the index of these vectors, of these vector fields at those points. However, the way we usually define a manifold, we use, open co we use charts and parameterizations. And we want to make sure that the index of a vector field is independent of such a parameterization. And not only that, but on top of all these ideas, we notice that if we slightly vary a vector field, like if I slightly perturb what this vector field looks like at an arbitrary point, then the index won't change. For instance, if we had in the previous video, we looked at examples where we had a sources and sinks and different flows in different directions. If I slightly modified those, for instance, if I maybe magnified the flow in one direction and maybe made the flow in another direction a little bit smaller, then this would still give me an example of a source. And the index will be the same. You can check this. Uh, if I slightly varied the, let's say, the beta coordinate to be, I don't know, 5 and maybe alpha to be just 1, I would still find that the index is 1. 
Or another situation is I can slightly skew the picture. And my eigenvectors for these different directions might not have been the x and the y axes. I might have had, for instance, a skewed source where the sources go out like this from that point. And the eigenvectors are, let's say, one is along the x direction, but maybe one is along the 30 degree line. And the index in this situation is also 1. So we want to make sense of all of these different ideas together. And for that, we'll need a couple of definitions. And the first definition is important in its own right. Um, it's the notion of slightly perturbing a function. So let m and n be smooth manifolds. And suppose that we have two smooth functions. Sometimes we might be able to connect these smooth functions by a one parameter family of functions. And when we can do that, we say that the two functions are homotopic. And the actual one parameter family of maps is called a homotopy. So a smooth homotopy from f to g is a smooth function. And it's going to depend on a parameter. So we'll make that parameter a little bit simple. And we'll just say that it's the unit interval. So we have a smooth function from the unit interval cross the manifold such that if I restrict h to 0, and here dash just means that I'm leaving that as an open variable, then this gives me the function f. And if I restrict to 1, then I get the function g. So this is what a smooth homotopy from f to g is. And f and g are known, are said to be smoothly homotopic if such an h exists. And when we, when we write something like this, it's often intuitively nice to think of a smooth homotopy as itself a sort of a function from f to g. And the reason we draw this is because for every element in x, for each x in n, what we get is when we restrict h to just this unit interval and we've plugged in an x. So we have now in, this, in the first variable, we leave that open. What we get is a path because we have a function from 0, 1, the interval 0, 1, to m. And we get a path whose value at 0 is f of x and whose endpoint is g of x. So this is a path from 0, 1 to m, interpolating between fx and gx. So that's one of the reasons why we draw it like this, so that we, it reminds us that it's connecting the two functions, f and g, and they do it pointwise, but also there's a smoothness condition on the entire h function as well. There's a theorem, or rather several theorems, and one theorem is that smooth homotopy is an equivalence relation. In the sense that it's reflexive, so f is smoothly homotopic to itself. Sorry, it's a, uh, yeah, and it's symmetric. So if f is smoothly homotopic to g, then g is smoothly homotopic to f. And it's also transitive. f to g, g to h, let's say lowercase h so we don't confuse ourselves, um, then f is smoothly homotopic to h. Um, and the proof is not immediately obvious, and the reason is because I haven't demanded um, any kind of smoothness conditions at the endpoints. And to prove transitivity, you want to put these two homotopies together. Um, and you might have to worry about whether it's smooth at these endpoints. So you have to fix that using a bump function, for example. Um, and similarly, we can define another closely related notion. Um, if f and g 
are not only smooth functions, but if they're diffeomorphisms, then we can look at a path from f to g, in other words, a smooth homotopy. But what if that smooth homotopy at any instant in time is no longer a diffeomorphism? What if it's just a smooth function? We want to also uh, distinguish the two different cases of where at every single point in time we have a differentiable, uh, a diffeomorphism. So if f and g are diffeomorphisms and h of t blank is a diffeomorphism for all t in let's say 0, 1, then h is, a, is known, is called a smooth isotopy. And we'll find plenty of examples um, in a moment where we generalize this notion to not only talk about smooth homotopies, but also something that's very closely related to vector fields, which is known as a flow. And a flow is sort of like a, a smooth homotopy, but it's not only defined for all time in some closed interval, but it's defined for all time, period. And those will be related very closely to vector fields. And we'll describe a way to go from one to the other and back as well, assuming certain conditions. And we should give uh, at least one example um, of a smooth homotopy. So let's look at the sphere, for instance, right here. Um, and let's look at the identity function. And in this sphere, we sort of imagine that it's being rotated. Um, let's also compare this to the function f. Uh, let's say f is given by rotation by, let's say, um, 90 degrees or something like that. So if it's 90 degrees, the rotation along the z-axis. So then we get uh, 0, negative 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. So let's say this is what f is, and of course restricted to the sphere. Um, then I can say, what's a smooth homotopy from the identity function to f? So if I look at this example, I can take h of, let's say, let's call it, uh, well, let's call it t. Um, then this is going to be, let's also write it as a matrix, because these two are actually matrices. And we'll actually find a homotopy not only of diffeomorphisms, but diffeomorphisms obtained from restricting linear transformations. So this is going to be cosine. So we get cosine pi t, sine minus sine pi t, 0, 0, 1, sine pi t, cosine pi t, and then 0, 0 here. So this defines a smooth homotopy because this function is a function of t. And by the way, I'm leaving out the second coordinate. This is where x is. This is a point on the sphere, and we're plugging in points on the sphere, applying this transformation, and getting another point on the sphere for all t. And it agrees with the identity function at t equals 0, and it agrees with f when t equals 1. Um, I guess I wanted 90 degrees, so it should actually be pi over 2, right? Now it should be correct. Um, so this is an example of a smooth homotopy on a manifold.